Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, as the title of the video says, today we're going to talk about my eight electrical tips for model railroaders. And just about everything that I'm going to cover today was also in my book, Wiring Your Model Railroad, published by Kalmbach Publications. And this is available on their website at Kalmbach Books. You can also find this on Amazon.com under Amazon Books and also many hobby shops offer this for sale. So take a look at all of those sources. If you don't have a copy, I recommend getting one because everything I practically know about wiring model railroads is incorporated in the text of this book. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the video. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Now, my first tip for you is pick a control system for your model railroad. You might decide to go with DCC, you might decide to stick with DC, or you might decide to jump into the new Blue Nami control or the new Bluetooth control type of systems available on the market today both from Soundtracks and from Hornby and from various others. The important thing though is figure out exactly what you're going to be using. If you're going to be using DC or if you're going to be using DCC or if you're just going to be working with battery power, Blue Nami or Bluetooth technology. It's very important up front that you know that because it's going to control and influence how you do all of your wiring for your model railroad. And I'll probably be reminding you of that as I go through the rest of these tips for you. And I can't say this enough. It can be very costly for you to change once you have made a decision to go one way or the other. Because a lot of the things that you will be doing in wiring your model railroad are dependent on the current, the amperage, and the control system that you will be using. Okay, so you've started laying track and you want to run power out to it and you've decided that you're going to use DC or you're going to use DCC. Now, it's very important that you use the right size wire. Why is that? Well, with DC, you're probably talking about using under one amp, and your runs aren't going to be all that long because your blocks are going to be broken up all around the layout, and you're going to have to have different controls at each one of those sections. Whereas with DCC, you can have much longer runs around your layout, and you're going to be using much higher amperages. You can be looking at something like 3, 5, 8, even 10 amps running through those wires. And if you know anything at all about your electrical wiring in your house, you know that you use a 14 gauge wire for a 15 amp circuit. You, knew you have to use a 12 gauge wire for a 20 amp circuit and so on. So the more amperage you've got flowing through wires, the bigger those wires have to be. And that's true for DCC as well, and DC really. So in this case, if you're going to be using DC power, you're probably going to be talking about fairly thin wires, something, you know, under 16 gauge or smaller. Whereas with DCC, you, I recommend at a minimum for HO and OOO, S scale, something like that, 14 gauge, if your runs are under 30 feet. If your runs are over 30 feet, and when you get into the larger scales, then you're probably going to want to kick up to 12 gauge wire. If you're doing in scale or Z scale, you can probably get away with 16 gauge wire, or in some cases even smaller, for very short runs. So be aware of that. Pick the size wire that you need for your model railroad. And it's very important that you do that in order to be able to get consistent operations. And that's one of the reasons why you have to make that decision about whether you're going to go with DC or DCC up front, because you need to have different size wires for each control technology. Now, on my model railroad, I use what's called zip cord. And what that is, it's just like the lamp wiring in your house, except this is 14 gauge. And as I've talked about in other videos, it does reduce the electronic noise that gets into your DCC signal, and it also helps maintain the signal itself because the two wires are right up against each other and they cancel out any electromagnetic noise that might interfere with them. Now, you could also use individual strands. 
and as long as you're under 30 feet, you can just run these next to each other. However, once you get out more than 30 feet, you're going to want to twist these. But twisting is something that is recommended by a number of manufacturers, particularly for your long runs, because long runs can bring in a lot of issues. Now, once you get into smaller, like I said, you can go with much smaller wire. This is 16 gauge insulated wire, and you know, you can use either stranded or solid wire. And the suitcase connectors that I use, generally they can be used with either stranded or with solid wire. So be aware of that. And if you go to the 3M website and go to the section that covers the suitcase connectors or IDCs, as they are technically called, they tell you there whether or not the different sizes and different types can be used with both stranded and solid. And in most cases, because of the low voltages and low amperages, they can be used with either. Now, another very important tip is develop a color coding scheme for your different wires, because you're going to have a number of different wires running under your model railroad. You're going to have two wires for your DCC power bus, if it's that. You're going to have different color wires for your DC buses. And so you need to be able to tell all those different wires apart and their different functions. Now, part of that is just going with different colors. So you can have red and green for your main bus. You can have black and white for your accessory buses. There are just a number of different wire colors available to you. Now, a lot of people uh, get confused because this looks like it's just one wire color. Actually, if you look real close, you can see this one is silver wire and this is copper colored wire. That's because this is copper in here and this is tin coated copper. So there's a silver and there's a copper colored wire in here so I can tell them apart. So this is red and that's silver. That's how I go about color coding the main power bus. And then I use other combinations of colors elsewhere under the layout for different functions. Now it's also important that you label your wires as to their function and that can be directly or you could use a coded system that you develop and keep track of. And what I do is, I've got these little tags here. And what they are, they're the typical zip type connectors, little nylon things, and they got this little flag built into it. So you can write right on here with a magic marker what this wire, what a particular wire is for, put this around it, and you can tell instantly when you're trying to debug an electrical problem, you can find the wire you want because you've got a tag. Another thing that's very important, keep a notebook. And this right here is my Piedmont Southern Notebook. And in it, I have everything about the model railroad. From the beginning, I have the track plan of the model railroad, which I think I've shown you in the past. I've got a preliminary schedule here. And then I have notes on my power management blocks, the, volt, the amperage assignments for each, the wiring code that I have developed for it. All of that is in here. So that sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? But your model railroad can get very complex very quickly. Now, if you've only got two wires, it's not a problem. But in general, if you're using DC or DCC, you're going to have a lot of different wires doing a lot of different functions. You're going to have probably a DC power bus in order to provide power for your accessories. You need to be able to tell those apart. And that's where having a color code and having tags on the wires can help you keep them separated. Several years ago, a friend of mine who has a very large layout, bigger than the Piedmont Southern here, uh, built that in his basement, and he had a friend do the wiring for him. Well, when we started operating that layout, we couldn't get through an operating session without having problems, electrical problems. At that point, we finally had to break down and set aside a week or two to just go through the layout and figure out what had been done. And we had to do that because, unfortunately, the fellow who had done the wiring had died in the meantime, and nobody else knew what he had done. In addition, he had not taken any notes at all. So we had to go through that entire model railroad, figure out what he had done, and fix it. And it's run great ever since then. But now at least we know how it was done. So don't run into that problem yourself. Keep good notes on what you've done, because believe it or not, five years, ten years down the road, you will forget what you did. Okay, the next tip, track feeders. 
make sure you use an adequate number of truck feeders. And with DCC power, it is very important that you have enough of them. My recommendation is that you have feeders to the track every six to eight feet with code 100 and code 83, and even closer together for the smaller rails. So once you get down to code 55, something like that, you might be running a feeder every three feet. And the reason for that is because nickel silver rail is nowhere near a good a conductor as copper itself. So you're gonna lose voltage, you're gonna lose power as you go down the track. And unfortunately, that's just one of those things you have to deal with. You have to provide an adequate number of feeders for the size of rail that you're working with. Okay, my next tip deals with frogs. And as I've said in many videos in the past, power your frogs. It isn't that difficult to do, particularly if you're using tortoise switch machines, IP digitals, Walther switch machines, all of the various switch machines uh, available today that I'm aware of have the ability uh, for you to provide power to your frogs and provide the correct power. And it really is important, even with HO scale, uh, for steam locomotives, for short wheel wheelbase diesels, for locomotives that have traction tires, they can be very sensitive to a dead frog. Now, in in-scale and smaller, it's even worse. And in in-scale, you really do need to have those frogs powered because unfortunately, it's very difficult to get a keep alive into the in-scale locomotives. So you're better off up front, just power your frogs, do it, and you'll be happier in the long run. Okay, and now for my next tip. Install a DC power bus under your layout along with your DCC or your control bus. Why is that? Well, you're going to eventually need a source of power for LEDs and for other DC powered accessories on your model railroad. So go ahead, get that in as you build. Do not figure that you're gonna come back and do it later on. It'll be a pain in the neck. In addition to having a 12 volt DC accessory bus, I also recommend in areas where you're gonna have a lot of LEDs, instead of providing a dropping resistor for each one, create a secondary or sub bus at about three volts so that you'll have a direct way to wire those. And for those, I use the little buckboards that I've shown you in the past, and I'll try to find that video and put it up here, uh, where I have shown how I install a three volt sub bus for my LEDs at various points on the modern railroad where I'm gonna to need to do more than just a couple of those. So think of that, get your LED power uh, established, and also any other accessories that you're gonna to wanna to power off of DC, run your bus under your layout. And on the Piedmont Southern, I have a 10 amp accessory power bus rated at 12 volt DC that powers all of the accessories here on the model railroad. Okay, for the next one, and this is where planning ahead, again, can be very important. If you're going to be using block occupancy detection on your model railroad, install those detectors as you do your wiring. And that, again, it might sound like it's a lot of pain in the neck up front to do all of that, but remember, block occupancy detectors have to be wired into those wires that are going to your blocks. So you're gonna to have to do it sooner or later, you're better off to do it up front instead of having to crawl around under your layout and retrofit those down the road sometime. Now the final one deals with a very complex issue and that's one on grounds because there's different types of grounds. And the two I'm gonna talk about today are floating grounds and earth grounds. Now, a lot of people get confused over the difference for those. Now an earth ground means that you have a wire that grounds your equipment that goes to the outside and is attached to a steel rod or a copper rod or some other kind of rod that is driven six feet into the ground so that you have a direct earth ground that goes into the earth. And the electrical panel box in your house has an earth ground that goes outside and is connected usually now to two grounding rods driven into the ground. Now, in addition to the earth ground that is provided for your electrical box, they typically also require a earth ground be connected to the main water pipe where it comes into the house as well, so that you've got a lot of grounding going on there. 
Now you will hear people tell you that you need to attach a ground from your DCC system to an earth ground. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend doing a floating ground, and I'll talk about that one in a second. Now, what are some reasons though for having an earth ground? Well, let's say that you're in a house in an area where you have a lot of static electricity that builds up in you as you shuffle around in the basement, and when you touch anything, you get a zap. Well, that can happen with your DCC equipment too. So in those cases, yeah, an earth ground will actually ground that equipment and take it to earth so that you won't build up static electricity in your DCC system. But as far as I'm concerned, you should create your own separate earth ground for that. You can do that by running a wire outside, driving a rod in the ground, and connecting it. Now, of course, your power supplies themselves are grounded where they are plugged into the wall. So you don't have to worry about those. It's important though that, that you do have some sort of ground between most types of DCC equipment. And that's where the idea of a floating ground comes in. Now a floating ground simply means that you have a ground wire that runs between your various pieces of DCC equipment. So your command station has a ground output on it, and you could put a wire in there and run that to the booster, which will also have a ground connection, and make a connection there and onto the next booster in line. Also, various other pieces of equipment may require or provide a ground attachment for that. And in particular, I know that if you look at the wiring diagrams for NCE systems, they show a ground between them, and in the manual they talk about it being a floating ground. And that simply means that the individual pieces of equipment are grounded to one another. So basically, a floating ground is used to provide a reference potential between the various pieces of equipment in your DCC system. So let's take a look quickly at a diagram from NCE that shows their wiring system. And you can see in this that there is a ground wire, and it's labeled as a ground, that runs from the command station to the booster and then to the next booster in line. And that's what is referred to as a floating ground because it is not connected to your household ground or to an earth ground. It's just serving as a reference potential between the various pieces of equipment. And it's very important that you use that on your NCE equipment. I use it on all of my Digitrax equipment and recommend it. Um, in some of their manuals, you will see Digitrax suggesting that you connect to your household ground. Uh, as again, I don't do that. I prefer to have my hobby equipment totally isolated from the household equipment, and that serves that purpose. Now, various other types of DCC systems may not provide for an external ground of any type. And in those cases, I believe that they are depending on the ground wire that runs between the different systems through an eight wire cable or something of that type. So they're depending on their own wiring to make that ground connection and that reference ground. Whereas with Digitrax and with NCE, I know that you do have to provide a floating reference ground between command stations and boosters and some other types of equipment. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. I hope I've given you some tips that will help you with wiring your model railroad. And don't forget, take a look at my book, Wiring Your Model Railroad, available from Kambach Books or from Amazon and at many local hobby shops. I think you'll find it a very useful reference material when building your model railroad. So have a great weekend, have a great week, and I'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.